Fahrenheit. This is a different fuel from Falcon 9 where we use the RP-1 kerosene. But our oxidizer is liquid oxygen, the same as Falcon 9. Because there is no oxygen in space to support combustion, we have to bring our own. We did the weather pole and the go-no-go -no -go pole at T minus two hours. We got the goes and we started loading both propellants on the booster at T minus one hour and 36 minutes. And at T minus one hour and 17 minutes, we began propellant loading of the ship second stage. Propellant loading of the Starship second stage main tanks will complete at approximately T minus 22 minutes, just a few minutes from now. And at about the same time, we will switch the same time, we will switch over to loading the header tanks in the nose of the ship. Meanwhile, it'll be T minus three minutes when super heavy prop load completes on the first stage. And at that point, all propellant will be on the rocket, fully loaded with over 10 million pounds of propellant. As we near T0, it's worth noting that the timing of the countdown will be slightly different today. For flight one, we lit the engines and lifted off about six seconds later. For flight two, we aim to reduce that time by almost two seconds, shortening the period between engine start and liftoff. This will help reduce stress on the ground and the propulsion systems and improve the efficiency of the rocket. Now, right now, we're just inside T minus 25 minutes to liftoff. The weather and winds are looking good. We haven't had any concerns there. The only issue we're working is getting the uh, small boats out of the near range area in the uh, offshore from Boca Chica Starbase. We do have the possibility of holding at T minus 40 seconds as we're trying to get the last of the boats out of the safety area. Now, if for some reason we do not make our test flight today, we have a backup launch windows. This could be either 24 or 48 hours after today. It depends on how far we get into the countdown. But for now, everything's looking good as we've passed coming up on the 24 minute mark. I'll hand it back to you, Kate and Shiva. Thanks, John. Now that countdown is continuing to progress. So let's take a look at the, uh, and get more familiar with the vehicle there on your screen. Starship is the world's most powerful launch vehicle. It's currently uh, about, or excuse me, currently with about twice the thrust of the Saturn V rocket, and with future engine upgrades, it will be three times more powerful. Those future improvements will allow Starship to carry 150 to 250 metric tons to orbit. Now, for reference, Falcon 9's heaviest payload to date is about 17 metric tons. So we're talking about an order of magnitude more with Starship in terms of payload capability. And that matters because the amount of mass that we're able to launch per rocket is crucial to ultimately creating a self-sustaining city on Mars. Now, let's talk a little bit about how tall the vehicle is. The super heavy booster alone stands about 70 meters tall, and that's about the same height as a fully integrated Falcon 9. The height of Starship on top of it is comparable to that of the Statue of Liberty. But of course, the most technical length unit is that of Godzilla's. And we can confidently say that the fully stacked Starship and Super Heavy is at least one epic Godzilla tall. It just so happens that we refer to the launch and catch tower at Starbase as the Mechazilla from the Godzilla movie. And you can see from that that the resemblance is quite uncanny. Very, very uncanny. <laughs> Now, the first stage, also known as the booster or super heavy, has a uh, excuse me has a diameter roughly two and a half times that of Falcon 9, and with 33 much larger engines. More engines means more power to deliver a massive amount of cargo to space. Amazing view here. Uh, this is a view that we don't have on our Falcon 9 missions. Uh, this is a view look up, looking up under the Super Heavy booster. I love the shot. We can see all 33 uh, engines there. Now, one cool upgrade on the booster's engines, we have a new electronic thrust vector control system, or ETVCs. We previously used the hydraulic system to control the positioning of the Raptor engines, meaning we tilted them in flight using pressurized fluid. Now, hydraulics are complex, and because they're fluid-based, they have the potential to leak. Not good. So, switching to an electronic system means fewer potential points of failure. Also, we now carry less mass on the vehicle because we don't need to carry hydraulic fluids anymore. So, uh, good news all around. Now, the electric system has lots of benefits on its own. It only takes 30 minutes to activate for flight, it doesn't consume resources when inactive, and they allow for regenerative charging like a Tesla battery.
Yeah, all great things when you're trying to rapidly reuse a vehicle. Now moving up, Starship is designed for vertical takeoff and landing on any hard surface. That's opposed to taking off and landing on a runway like aircraft do. And that's important because there are no runways on the moon and Mars. The ship features six Raptor engines, three of which are sea level, and three of which are vacuum engines with an expanded nozzle, which makes them optimized to operate in the vacuum of space. The ship uh, at the top of the boot, excuse me, the ship is featured with four flaps as well. This is a shot actually of the top of the booster where we can see uh, the hot stage portion and the four grid fins. Now, those flaps on the ship portion help aerodynamically control the vehicle's attitude during atmospheric reentry and flight and will enable us to do precise landings. The body of Starship is also wrapped in a heat shield that's made up of 18,000 hexagonal ceramic tiles. You can see them wrapping around the top of the nose here and here in this shot of the flaps. Uh, now, those tiles are designed to insulate the vehicle during atmospheric entry, where the temperatures can get as high as 1,500 degrees Celsius. And one of our test objectives today is to verify how those systems perform during reentry. Yeah, now as Shiva mentioned there, between the ship and um, the booster, basically the top of the booster, between those two stages, that's our new hot stage, critical for our new separation technique. Uh, as we talked about earlier, we are constantly learning and upgrading the vehicle after we test. Now, this is a pretty exciting first for our team as hot staging has never before been used as part of a reusable space transportation system, let alone on a rocket with the size and power of Starship. Hot staging is a significant change from Flight 1, and we're really hoping to gather data on it during this highly dynamic uh, phase of flight, and that is, once again, assuming that we even make it that far. Of course, let's take a closer look at what we expect hot staging to look like. Now, at, it occurs at about liftoff plus two and a half minutes. At that point, the booster will shut down most of its 33 engines, leaving just three running, and the ship will ignite all six of its engines. Clamps will re uh, release, and then the ship will thrust away from the booster. Now, this is the first in-flight test of the heat shield on the top of the booster and the bottom of the ship, and of course, the first in-flight test of hot staging, and we're hoping to gather a ton of data on it today. Yeah, now, stage separation by hot staging is somewhat uncommon in spaceflight, but it has been done before. However, today will mark the first time that a reusable space transportation system is attempting it. Uh, the Titan program did hot staging quite successfully in the early 1960s, uh, but they were not concerned with reuse, so there was no issue when the Titan first stage took considerable damage uh, upon ignition of the second stage engine. Now today, there is a good chance that our booster will also incur some damage from the second stage engines, but we need to test it out, see if the system can tolerate it and collect data to learn how to do hot staging better next time, because ultimately, when successful, it could increase Starship's payload to orbit capacity by 10%. So more payload and more people to Mars. Um, hot staging also helps us maximize the vehicle's performance by leaving those first, those three first stage engines on so gravity can't rob us of precious velocity or at least not as much of it. Uh, hot staging also helps to ensure the ship's liquid propellants are at the bottom of the prop tanks, which is where we need them, which is where we need that propellant to be in order to quickly light the ship's engines. Another reason to do hot staging, it reduces the risk at stage separation by moving to a passive stage sense by excuse me by moving to a passive stage system deleting parts and simplifying meaning physics is going to be doing most of the work instead of mechanical parts that would otherwise be pushing the two stages away from each other that's a great summary and and of course this required design changes from flight one the most notable of which is the inner stage here. So on flight one, that inner stage was completely enclosed, but for hot staging, the inner stage portion between the booster and the ship is gonna see dramatic increases in pressure and temperature. So we had to change the structure to include vents for the exhaust gases that the ship's Raptor engines will produce. Now, the three center engines on the ship actually gimbal, they rotate, and we're going to be gimbling them outwards to reduce the forces that are being directly imparted on the booster and maximize the exhaust gas that's going through those vents. We've also beefed up the ship's base heat shield to withstand the higher temperatures and pressures. And for today's test, like really getting through hot staging would be a major milestone. There are some risks associated with this test, um, but 
Of course, the ship and booster are going to be pretty far out over the ocean in the safety zone and far away from people. Yeah, regardless of what happens, it's going to be super exciting to watch. <laughs> now, in addition to the first and second stages of the vehicle, Starship has a third stage that we call Stage Zero. This consists of the launch mount, the tower, and the tank farm, all of which you can see there on your screen, uh, as well as the pad infrastructure built around the rocket. Um, fun fact, it's the Guinness Book of World Records holder for the largest launch tower in the world. What a beautiful drone shot that we have here. Um, also important part of the system, but less visible right now, uh, especially because of the fog, uh, is our new water-cooled steel flame deflector. Uh, and that's certainly a new upgrade for this flight. Yeah, on flight one, the Starship's launch pad was damaged pretty significantly during liftoff as those super heavy Raptor engines fired their full thrust into the foundation for more than 12 seconds. So now we have a new high pressure water cooled steel flame deflector system that we developed and installed between the flights. And there you can see the video of it dispensing 260,000 gallons of water. And that's designed to dissipate those loads from the Raptor engines and support rapid turnaround of the launch pad with minimal refurbishment between flights. Part of a rapidly reusable launch system also means the pad infrastructure. Yeah. We performed multiple standalone tests and have used this uh, new system for both the Flight 2 booster static fire tests. And we've also reinforced the pad pretty significantly from Flight 1. Yes. Now, also uh, part of Stage 0, we mentioned before the launch mount. Kind of hard to see there, but it's what the booster is connected to. Oh, here we can see uh, basically the legs of the launch mount. Um, this is what holds Starship and all of its mass. It holds Starship during ignition, uh, right there at the Super Heavy booster. This is what houses all of the equipment needed to fuel the Super Heavy booster and condition it for flight, as well as all of those electrical, communication, and data connections between the ground and Starship. Um, bottom line is it's an important part of how we talk to Starship on the ground and understand that it's really ready to fly. And of course, the awesome camera shot there of those 33 Raptor uh, engines. Such a great view. We yeah. don't have that view for Falcon 9, I so I love could. that we get it here. Now, as we mentioned earlier, the real game changer with Starship is not only mass to orbit capabilities, but that it's designed to be used over and over and over again with little to no time uh, downtime in between. Full and rapid reusability is the key to making uh, routine space travel a reality, and SpaceX has been working on this since its inception. Yeah, with SpaceX's family of Falcon launch vehicles, which are the first and only orbital class rockets capable of reflight, we started that. And Starship is going to take this even further with a reusable first and second stage. Now, while most rockets are expended after their portion of the mission, SpaceX rockets land back on Earth and are quickly returned to our hangars to prepare to refly again. Exactly. Uh, in fact, 90% of all Falcon 9 boosters that have flown this year have been reused, uh, or as we like to say, flight proven. So while launching and landing rockets may seem routine today, this was not always the case. For those of you that have been following along since our early days, you know that it took us four attempts before we successfully launched our first rocket to orbit. Here you see our Falcon 1 Flight 4. 15 years ago in September, that vehicle became the first privately developed liquid-fueled launch vehicle to orbit Earth. If Falcon 1 Flight 4 had not succeeded, it would have meant the end of SpaceX. And our first successful landings didn't come easily. We had to miss the target a few times before we ultimately stuck the landing. But each of these landing attempts of how to not land an orbital rocket were teaching us what we needed to know in a flight-like environment to get that full picture of how all the systems interacted together. Oh man, yeah, this is me trying to not get goosebumps watching this first drone ship landing. I hosted that webcast and it was so exciting to see that that iterative development approach that we took finally paid off after so many attempts of failing. Um, now that failure is expected to help improve future designs of our vehicles and systems. So fast forward to present day, we've landed F9 boosters over 245 times since our first reflight of an orbital class booster six years ago. Yeah, and it really comes down to our design philosophy. If you're not failing in some way, then there's room to learn and push the design to improve. And, and failure doesn't just mean blowing up a rocket. It might mean not being as efficient as we want to be or producing slower than we want to.